Um, this is a new thing for us uh, as a department, and so we, we do have a couple of venues for a student. Uh, we have the opportunity for, we have a student advisory board, so some of you may be aware of that, um, some of you may, may not, but part of that's a, a group of students that's nominated and voted on by the student body in mechanical engineering. Uh, has the opportunity to have a voice uh, and talk, you know, hear, hear some things about the department and then hear like what we're doing and then an opportunity to feedback that information back to us as well, like what's happening with the students. So um, as we were thinking about this, we thought, well, maybe, maybe there's another a broader opportunity to have um, a discussion, have an open forum discussion. So if you are a, you know, a student that has a, um, a question or, a, a, you know, concern or comment or positives, negatives, anything like that, um, having an opportunity to, to interact with, with that, with, in, that, in a space with, with me uh, as the chair of the department, that would be a, kind of a good thing to really promote student voice. And that's kind of what we're looking at with this seminar. Um, and so we might, we're, we're thinking about doing these once, maybe once a semester or once a year, depending on, uh, on the, uh, how, how it goes. If, if it's worth doing more than, you know, more than once a year, then we'll do, we'll do once a semester. So, um, so it kind of depends on your feedback, how, how, you, how you see it, if it's useful or not. So um, if you do have thoughts after the work, afterwards, whether you liked it or didn't like it, I'd certainly like to hear from you because I guess, again, that'll influence on how we, uh, how we move forward with it. So, all right, so what I had in mind was I'm gonna start with a couple of slides and then I have a lot of slides, but I don't have, I'm not gonna go into the slides unless you have questions about them. Um, and if there's no questions, then maybe I'll just go ahead and start with them. <laughs> so they're kind of a, maybe for a, a little bit of a backup. Um, I also will say here at the beginning that uh, you know it's a, I, I really look forward to questions. I've, I think it's important to have that have a dialogue. So I, I really want you to feel like you can ask my, ask a question. If you're not comfortable talking in front of uh, somebody in this in here in this venue, then you can certainly email me or come to my office and uh, and we can have a more more private chat about something. If you have a concern or a comment or any anything really, it doesn't it doesn't matter. So. Um, so that's kind of what I would just kind of set the stage a little bit. And, and I'm not going to claim that I'm going to know every <coughs> single answer. So I'm going to start that right off the, off the bat. You may, uh, there may be 15 questions, and I may not be able to answer 14 of them. But what I'll do is I'll write them down. If, we have, if, I, if I can't get a good answer, then I'll write it down and we'll, and we'll go back and uh, we'll, we'll be able to revisit those questions. So, so, uh, just, so you, just so you know, I'm not omnipotent. <laughs> All right, so um, I guess first of all, I did another thing I wanted to say, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. So uh, academic departments, like the mechanical and biomedical engineering, um, have a group of faculty, and then they have sort of a leadership group, um, and, and, the, and the head of that is, the, is what they would call the chair. Sometimes it's called the head, depending on the, the way it works in the different departments, but uh, the chair or the head of the department is, is kind of the person that, that does a lot of the interaction with, with other departments and other faculty within the faculty and also a lot of student, uh, student you know, back and forth. So there's a lot of um, information that I deal with related to how, how this department uh, interacts with the university, you know, and how, you know, priorities within the university, the college and the university, so above me. And then also I, I, I work with a lot of student issues um, and also curriculum and things like that. So. Um, so those of you, some of you've had me in class. You, 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 I'm not, not shy about talking about things, and so I'm pretty transparent. There's some maybe certain things I can't say, but I, but I am pretty open about how things work. So um, just want to give you a sense for what what my role is. So you, you ask questions. I can't I can't maybe tell you the meaning of life, um, other than maybe my own opinion. So even that, I don't even know if I <laughs> I wouldn't even attempt that one probably. Um, one, one thing I do want to start with, a couple slides I said, and then we'll get, get started. But uh, one of the things that we've done as a faculty, and this is, I think it's important about building a culture within our department. And our, our department includes the faculty, but it also includes our student body and our staff and everybody that participates in this uh, experience that, that, you're, that you're going through. And so we've had, a, we have a, at least within the faculty and staff, we've had a discussion about values and how what we believe as a, as a group, some of the things that we share. We actually went through an exercise and we thought through these things and um, as a group we, we found that these were things that we all shared. So some people have other things that they, they find that are valuable, but these are things that we share together. And so um, we, we see uh, things that we are, 
are, we, 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 like the, we like the idea of being innovative. So it's, you know, don't just think about the same exact way all the time. Being impactful. So the things that we do make a difference. You know, make, have, have some, um, some impact, obviously, on, on, on the world or on the department, on the city of Boise, any, anything like that, or ourselves. Uh, we're inclusive and respectful. So we, when we talk, we, you know, we, we listen, and we, we don't just, you know, we're, uh, we, we try to uh, understand each other's opinions and, and then be listen, listen and respectfully. Maybe we disagree, but that doesn't mean we can't respect each other. Uh, cooperative and collaborative, we really value working together and um, having uh, not just individuals, but a collaborative team on different things, and we really we, we do value that. It's part of being an industry as well. I think that's a good thing going forward. And, and kind of the, maybe integrity is another word, but professional and ethical. I think that's, as we are a professional uh, organization or professional discipline, uh, we value the fact that engineers are going to go, have, go out and work in industry, and they have to have um, a moral compass. You know, you have to be able to do things that other people may say are not um, maybe the right, you know, maybe they push on you, maybe you should do this, maybe you should do this. You, you do have to have some level of uh, uh, internal integrity, so an internal value system. So it maybe it's something like this set of values, uh, or maybe something slightly different depending on yourself, but, there's, but there are ethical frameworks that we would work within and also a professional responsibility. So those, those things we value, again, as engineers, uh, as we're, um, as we're, uh, as we're performing the work that we do here. Um, and one real quick brief note, we are growing, I probably should have put this more towards the end, um, and next week we're going to have a, a, a sem another seminar speaker, this person will be a, a faculty candidate. So if you come back to the same time uh, next week, we're going to have a faculty candidate here. And when we, when we have discussions with them, we, we're also promoting those values within within these faculty candidates. And we want student perspective on the people that we're looking at hiring. And this particular person is going to be talking about um, solar energy, desalination, and the importance of heat transfer. So kind of a technical talk, but it will be geared towards students. And it will be in this, in, this, in this room. His name is Dr. Todd Botanikar. Did I say that right? OK. We'll have to ask him when he gets <laughs> Uh, a Tanikar. Anyway, he's, an, he's currently a professor at the University of Tulsa in mechanical engineering. So uh, this is this is him. He's got a, kind of a cool, he has some cool shoes on this picture. Of. I have to ask him about that one. So but anyway, uh, so he'll be here this time next next week, and uh, we hope that you all show back up uh, to this seminar and, and participate in those, and hopefully get your feedback on, on these new new faculty that are coming in. Okay, real briefly, I did want to give you a little bit more about who I am personally. Um, if you can't tell from my accent, I was born and raised 18 years of my life in Amarillo, Texas. Um, I worked at Marshall Space Flight Center. I went to Texas A&M uh, University of Mechanical Engineering. So I, uh, I was in the propulsion lab at Marshall Space Flight Center for a couple years. And then I graduated with a bachelor's in mechanical engineering in I-3. I went to work in Kentucky at Mark, Lockheed Martin Utility Services, where I was a, uh, an engineer for uh, capital improvement projects. And I've, I've told stories about that one as well. It was a, it's a uranium processing facility. I uh, worked there for a couple years. And then I went to work back in space and went back to astronautics for about five years and worked in uh, structural airframe fabrication for the Atlas Centaur, Titan Centaur, uh, J2. Uh, sort of Japanese rocket. There was another one called the uh, Athena. We had several different uh, fuselages that we worked on there. And then I moved to moved here in 2001. I graduated from the department. I was the second graduate with a master's of science in mechanical engineering from Boise State University in 2003. Barely missed number one. We were very new at the time. And, and then I got my, went on and got my PhD at U of I. Um, in 2007, I joined the faculty immediately thereof. I was the chair, associate chair for a year, 2013 and 2014. And then my, the, the chair left, <laughs> and that left me. Uh, <laughs> so succession plan, I guess. So that's happened in 2014, and so now here is, what, 2018? Almost 19. So I'm, uh, I'm, on, I'm on my fifth year as chair. I think I'm the longest now of, of the current chairs of all the departments I've, uh, I think I've maybe doubled 
the next longest serving chair, so it's kind of a weird place for me to be. So I guess that means I know a fair amount about stuff. Anyway, ground rules, anything goes, um, but you know, obviously keep it respectful. Faculty like Gus can only ask one question each. Sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, and, and you can't text questions to people, that's it. <laughs> so, uh, should put that on other. Uh, but again, I'll only ask if I can, and if I can't, I won't BS you, so to speak. And BS is Bachelor of Science. Um, share the floor with, you know, we don't want one person sort of, if they have like a whole 60 questions, you know, they have a list. Maybe we take some of them offline. I'd like to get a chance for everybody to have it. Um, and, you know, these are not inclusive, but, you know, some things that you might have questions about, curriculum or department metrics, professional fees, careers, internships, things like that, or anything else. So with that, um, I'll open the floor. Yes, sir. Um, so I worked at INL this summer, and there was a ton of people from the uh, University of Cincinnati, and they have like a co-op program there. Yeah. And I'm just wondering why Boise State hasn't looked into possibly getting a co-op program or doing something like that, because when I was there, there was probably like 40 interns from Cincinnati, and I was the only Boise State intern that I knew. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that proximity, I feel like we should have more people going into that facility. Okay. Good. And like, why a co op program is in are, place here? Are you, um, can, uh, just, uh, just so I understand, um, I'm going to write everything down. Yeah. Go. Um, so you're not just talking about co-op programs with INL, you're talking about co-op no, yeah. programs overall. So like Cincinnati, what they did was instead of having a four-year college degree, you had a five-year, and then you had to have five co-ops or internships, basically. Okay. And they would help you set those up through. Um, and then, I don't know, we have put like a ton of importance on internships, but I feel like it's kind of like do it on your own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's a wonderful question. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna kind of unpack it a little bit. So does anybody, I mean, there's, I, I think, I, I, I guess I'm curious as to how you see the difference in your perspective, what the difference between co-op and internship is. Um, I just kind of saw it as like, they had their school help them find all these internships and they had like a program in place where they, it was like something that they had to do. Like here I know it might not work as well because we have a lot of non-traditional students. Yeah. Um, so maybe it could be like something that you like, at the beginning you, checked into or something like it would be like how there's like finished before how you can do that mm -hmm. you could possibly do the co-op program instead okay and then you could like have help finding internships and there would be like stuff already set up for people and then I don't know they still have to like apply for them but the school helps out a lot more I feel like than us where it's like oh here's a job posting right good luck right right um, good good point I think you I think you characterize it very well actually very 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 precisely um, well, I will uh, let me kind of go back real quick and uh, so when I was when I was here I was on a co-op program so I, I, that's why I was kind of quizzing you on to make sure we understood and so a and had this very big school and they have a, they have a, a, a center basically for all the place all devoted to co-ops and so cooperative education is kind of how it, how it is um, there's another program, I believe, in Oregon called the MECOP program, and I don't really remember what that stands for exactly, but it's, it's not just mechanical engineering, it's, it's all different types of disciplines, and it's a co-op type of experience, and the companies, it's not done through the school, it's done through the state government, so through Oregon state government, and they, and they actually help coordinate it from a, for all the schools, but it's outside of the schools, it's a state entity. So, so, um, so there, are, there, are, there are models to look at. And um, so first of all, what I would say is I think that would be a fantastic idea. I would really be supportive of doing that. Um, and so let me, I, I give, I'll give a little bit of what we've tried to do to this point. Um, when I first became chair, I started, I had, a, it was something that I really felt passionate about because I, I probably like you, I think that experiential learning in an internship or a co-op, either one, is a very valuable and probably almost to the point of essential part of being a good engineer or being able to pr project into the engineering uh, world, professional world, uh, as easily as possible. So um, I, I think there's a few avenues that we could take um, in terms of how we would do that. My, my concern right now is that if I could figure out a way to make sure that every student had access to an internship, I would make it mandatory. 
but for a couple of percent, one of the reasons you mentioned, one of the tra non-traditional students, what do you do about non-traditional students? Maybe students that already have a job, or students that um, maybe they maybe they have family concerns and they, and they, they can't relocate somehow. That, that becomes a problem. Um, and so it's, 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 a tougher, it's tougher for me to see mandating it until we know that we have the ability to play student, uh, every student to get one. Now our, our numbers are, I think, maybe 65% of our students in mechanical engineering um, have an internship of some sort during their college experience. And about 35-ish, I think, was it? Something that like that? Were, that, that actually got academic credit. 35%? That, yeah, so 35 roughly, 35% get academic credit currently. We've seen those numbers pretty pretty stable. We've seen a little bit of increase with those, but for the most part, um, they, they they've been stagnant. So so some of the pathways that I've been considering are the, the working with the Department of Labor, our state department, and, and having them be the clearinghouse, so to speak, for internships that they could help arrange. But it's a bigger lift than just our department. It, it, I think it really ends up being something bigger, like at a university level. And I think some of this bridge to career uh, entities that you hear about, maybe through College of Innovation and Design, those are some places where I think this can happen. Um, as it is now, what I do is I go out and I try to shake the trees a little bit to try to get you know, people with internships and show them the value of it. But you're right, it, it is more of a, uh, here's some opportunities, you're on your own. I, I agree with that. Um, so we're in a growing phase with that. So I. I, I think I value, I appreciate the, 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 the need for that. I'm not sure how to get there just yet, but I think it's something we should work on and get there. Um, just as a broad statement, if you do have an interest in internships, let me know, come by my office, uh, set up a time, we can talk about those things, and I maybe be able to help you with resumes. Um, Leandra uh, at Barusa, if you haven't had a chance to have Leandra look at your resume, uh, yet yeah, she does a fantastic job of, of doing that. The Career Center has some uh, resources. Um, what's his name? It's not Alex, right? Alex Gutierrez. Alex Gutierrez, okay. So Alex Gutierrez at, uh, at the Career Center is another good resource for, for that. And, um, and so between the two of them uh, and myself, we can help you set the stage for your internship uh, experience. And so um, in, the, in the meantime, while we figure out how to get a more automated system set up, that, that would be my suggestion. So, um, and, and INL is an interesting place. I think it's, it's, it kind of bums me out that, that they've got so many from University of Cincinnati and not yeah. too many from Boise State. That's yeah. got to change, right? Yeah, there's like three, I think, from Boise State out of like 350 interns. Yeah. And yeah, they said that they wanted more that just people wouldn't apply. So. I yeah. They, you know, it's a weird animal. But we've had these discussions with them before in the last few years, and we go out and we have this. Um, we go out there and they're like, "Oh, we want some more," and then we're like, "Well, come for a seminar," and then that, you know, they that that just it never they they don't ever agree to come back, and it's yeah. just I, I don't think it's because they don't want to. It's just we just have to be more. I think we just have to we just have to we should get a rid of car and just grab them and take them here. <laughs> So yeah, I think we should we should make it we should make a point to if nothing else get them here. Like if they were to give you a seminar here on what all the career opportunities and internship opportunities were at INL, I mean you guys could all apply with those things. And they generally have, like you said, a ton of them, and they're probably open like right now or getting ready to be open right now. So you know, <laughs> if they go out and look at the internship page, there is a standing link to INL's internship listings. And that is located on the departmental website, correct? Yes, go to the MBE resources and you'll find internships. Okay, and, that's, and so this is one link within the internship page. So those of you who are interested in internships, and if you haven't had one, you should be interested. Um, you should go out and check that page. Um, also check the newsletter. So, thank you, appreciate that. Yes, sir? This is right for the internship question. Again, yes. But what advice do you have to a student who's <coughs> At one point, just kind of like giving up hope of getting an internship at all. They're a senior and they're just like, what do I do? Just because they either haven't had time or they've applied for a lot of them and just the best they've gotten is an interview, maybe. Well, um, you know, I, I don't think so. So don't give up hope. I'd say start with that. You know, don't give up hope. You said, you said if you've given up hope, 
reverse that. Get back and you know you, you still have hope. You're all you're all young. You, you know you know I changed career. You saw me. I changed careers. What how many times? <laughs> like three times. You know um, you, you never know. You just never know. So so don't give up hope. Um, but it is a, it's, it's a little bit of developing your network. I think that you know there's certain the mechanics of like the, the working on the, the resume and things like that. But going out and developing your network. We had a speaker a couple of weeks ago here talking about professional networking and things like that, and and how do you how you work um, you know towards uh, maybe a, a, a conference that that you know local conference or something like that. Um, maybe people that you know. How do you how do you interact with these people? How do you go out? I, I remember just for instance recluse. Um, the director of engineering, former director of engineering, was telling us that they hire a lot of people just by coming off the street with a resume. They don't ever post anything. They just, they get so many people coming off the street with really good qualifications that say, I really like your company, I want to work there. And they, they hardly ever post actual jobs. They just, they just have people coming to them. And so, you know, if you don't see them posted, go out, you know, seek out, build them a part of your network. Say, I'm really interested in your company. I'd really like to know a little bit more about it, and then it, and then after that, then you can start saying, "Hey, let's let's develop, uh, let's develop, uh, you know, I can I can share my resume with you and that sort of thing." So, so I would start with that. So make sure your resume and all that are in good shape with Leandra and myself. And if you have uh, interests in certain fields, you can certainly uh, come come to see me about that or Leandra. There's a, there's a website there are links that go out and they say, "Hey, you should maybe talk to so and so. This student has." Already worked in this field, you know. I can tell you it won't take. I won't tell a long story, but I I was in Texas and working at A and M and Marshall Space Flight Centers in Alabama, and I decided I wanted to work there because they they do uh, big rocket propulsion, and I had a job lined up at jo uh, Johnson Space Flight Center in Texas, which is in Houston, which where man's place flight. But I didn't want. I wanted big rockets, and so I I uh, I sent them and talked with the person that was an alumni of A and M. And he gave me uh, the contact information for some people at the company. And I sent them a letter. They didn't have email back then. I <laughs> sent them a letter. <laughs> and, and I said, I'm coming to Alabama. And when I get there, I'd like to, to, to meet with you and talk with you about it. So I drove from Texas to Alabama. And I, and I got there, and I stayed in a, a camp, like a, a campground. And then the night before, I was supposed to go, you know, like the Monday before, I, got, I went out and got a hotel, a little motel. I took a shower, <laughs> so because it, it smelled like campfire, and so and then I went in and I said, "Here I am. I'm ready to interview." And they said, "Come on out." And they were super excited that I went that much trouble on my own to come out there, and they and they and they gave me offer to, to work there. So, be bold, I guess. Maybe that's the thing. Yes, sir. You, you want to tell the SpaceX story? Oh yeah, with uh, with Luke. Yeah, there's a student here, Luke uh, Shaughnessy. Sean Shanksy, I can't ever say his last name very well, but he uh, he he's graduating this 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 fall. Anyway, he um, he wanted to work with SpaceX, and so he went down to the to uh, I guess San Francisco or wherever it is, right around the Bay Area, there. and and he went into their facility, and he hung around and he kept bugging people, and he finally found some folks that looked like engineers, and he bugged them, and then he started got to know them, and then he ended up. Um, finding him, you know, getting to know him a little bit on LinkedIn. He was just in the lobby. They wouldn't even let they wouldn't let him in the facility, and he just bugged him until they you know, they let him in. Um, took him on a little tour with people that he that he was bugging, and then they ended up um, came back to Boise, as I understand it. I may have the timing on this a little bit off, but he came back to Boise and, and started looking at pictures of rockets and things online, and he modeled them up in CAD, and he did some modeling in Ansys, just on his own, just for fun, and he sent them. To this guy, and they thought he was like a corporate spy because they were so good. <laughs> and they were like, "How did you get this information?" He was like, "It's all on the web." And so uh, they's like, "You should come work for us." So he had ended up getting a job with SpaceX. So just persistence. Not, but you gotta remember, don't don't forget that ethical professional thing. Like he did not <laughs> steal the information, but they thought he did. So. <laughs> So, so anyway, part of it's a little bit of a, you know, persistence. Part of it's a little bit of maybe get outside of your comfort zone. Don't just send out emails and resumes constantly. You gotta, you gotta have to go out and work a little bit and do, do some things. More than happy to chat with you though, on any of you on an individual basis if you want to talk about that stuff. I, you know, we can set up time and we can help help put together a little strategy. Okay, next question. 
Do I got to sit up? Or, uh, yeah, one, one faculty, one question for faculty. That's it. You saw that rule right there. Right? Okay. Yeah, so make it a good one. Make it a good one. <laughs> no fails? Internships was it? Yes, sir. Back in the back. So is that particular skill set for the extracurricular which really enhances your resume for aerospace industry? Uh, uh, a skill set for extracurricular. You know, like you know, I'm sort of like some people like that time, which we might might enhance your resume. Um, for for aerospace in particular. Um, hmm. You know, um, it, it probably a little bit depends on the on the on the type of work that you would be interested in doing. Aerospace is pretty broad still, but um, the if you if you go back to kind of my story, um, you know, I I had done some work. I had a class in ethics actually the semester before, and I had done some work with uh, Werner von Braun, who was their one of the main uh, German rocket scientist with Nazi Germany, and he he had taken a lot of the ideas from uh, Robert Goddard, who was a United States scientist before the war, and they'd start building these small rockets, and then they and then they uh, turned that into a V2 rocket, which became you know um, a warhead delivery vehicle that they were bombing uh, London with, and you may have heard about that, and and so they were pretty advanced. You know, and, and Warner von Braun was the scientist behind that. And he he kind of got panned for his for you know taking his sort of interest in engineering and science and using it for you know lobbing bombs in London. But um, that's a different that's a different story. But I I was I was fascinated by that 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 story and, and how that sort of he, he moved and set up Marshall Space Flight Center so that he could do the Apollo missions and the Saturn V rocket and all that kind of stuff that went to the moon. And so that whole story uh, was deep and in, ingrained in my mind because I just loved these rockets when I was a kid, um, you know, four or five years old. I, my dad would bring these videos home. They were on real to real tapes. We would lock, watch the videos of the moon launch and over and over again. I was just fascinated with it. And so part of that was just sort of playing off. I mean, I was totally invested. I mean, I was a big Star Wars fan, you know, it was just all this space, space, space. And, um, that excitement really just showed through, and I, I think they, you know, talking about it. So there's things like that, but that, you're not talking about that kind of skill set. But part of it is excitement. I mean, just being passionate about something was was something that was really, really important. Yes. Um, one of our previous speakers uh, said something that impressed me. With the gentleman from Carroll County University, he said that um, you know, interests uh, mirror ability. So if you have if you have interest, you know, um, you know build a rocket. You know, yeah. Build a build guitar amp, work on your car, and make sure that those are showcased in your, in your resume. Because I don't know what we were hiring, that we were we were builders, and that's the person we'd ask the students to begin with. We wanted to know like what did you what do you do? What do you work on? What you know, what yeah. are your interests outside of engineering? Yeah, it's it's hard to I mean some of the skill sets are kind of the same, mm -hmm. but if you're a, if you build model rockets for fun and you go to NASA and, or to Lockheed Martin or whatever and you say, I just love model rockets and I just I just want to Build big rockets. Just it's just everything. It's my whole world. You know they're going to see that as passion in you, and they're going to they're going to find that. Now your skill sets within that. I mean your ability to work with your hands and all that kind of stuff certainly translates um, at, at some level, um, and, and certainly the work the ability to work on a team. If you want to get into some of these other sort of specific skill sets, if you're all if all you ever do is is individual work, and you know you work sit in a classroom and you and you do your homework and you turn it in and take your test and you turn them in and all that kind of stuff but you never work within a project group um, that, that becomes like well what has this person because aerospace is about hundreds hundreds of people hundreds of engineers on a team and so you have you have to be able to work well on a team and so oddly enough that that's a really important factor you know so what do you have that shows that you have the ability to work well on a team but you're not going one person's not going to build a rocket by themselves that's not going to happen and so so things like that um, the passion all that is, is, is really important. Um, but you know, like if you're building rockets by hand and you're using like cardboard and, and X-Acto knives, that's not how it's done. And, and so, so that doesn't necessarily translate directly. It's, it's really kind of the passion. Does that make sense? Okay, good question. Back there, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I was speaking with Lynn, one of the advisors over here at the Department of Engineering. Uh, Lynn Catlin? And uh, she had 
mentioned something about some upcoming department changes that may happen. I was just wondering if you might be able to shed some light on that or kind of take away the bill. Um, yeah, I, I actually have a, a, a fairly up-to-date slide for that. Let me just jump ahead real quick. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm going to caveat, number one, what you're, what you're seeing or what you heard about is a process that we are working on now, um, and we're probably still about a year away from really having it finalized. So we're, we are in the process as a department of, of looking at a modernized approach to mechanical engineering curriculum. So unfortunately, the, the problem, I think, is that most of this will probably happen after you guys are moved on, but it, 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 what, I, what I think it is, is that we're, that innovative, value of being innovative is something that we are, we're doing um, and looking for in, in our curriculum. And it, it's interesting, you go around the country and you look at what other institutions are doing and it looks like everybody else's curriculum looks just like everybody else's curriculum. There's not a lot of innovation and, and you know, we, we ask students to be innovative, but then when we turn around, when we turn around and look at ourselves, how are we being innovative as engineering educators? And so that's what this comes from. This does need to be, if we're going to be innovative, let's actually be innovative, not just force everybody else to be. So one of the things that we did was we, we went and we really, we went back to uh, some of our stakeholders. And so in previous years, we've asked students um, and we've asked alumni, we've asked industry, what are some things about the program that you would like to see? Some bigger, bigger picture things. And so we came up with uh, more experiential learning. So more opportunities to do that, you know, get your hands dirty and work on something. Um, hopefully more, I don't have it up there now. These are, this is a, not a great slide. But we also said flexibility. The ability to work and have maybe different degree paths and not just have the, everybody takes the same set of courses and you get a couple of electives around it. So what we're trying to do is provide more opportunities to tailor a degree. So maybe you want to get a business minor or an entrepreneurship uh, minor or certificate along with your mechanical engineering degree. How do you do that? Well, now it's not really very easy. And so, so those things, and also maybe some themed or emphasis areas. A lot of interest in that. So themed and interest, in, emphasis areas, they, like the aerospace that we've, we've been, a lot of people have interest in, uh, is that a way that we can look at having an emphasis in aerospace or biomedical or startup or something like that? So, so what we're trying to do is, is incorporate those things into our curriculum. And so this is a, again, this is a very draft-oriented map. In fact, it's not even the newest one. But what we've tried to do is make some changes in our curriculum. And so, for instance, we have, currently we have four courses in the thermal fluid sciences. And so what we've done is we've turned that into, in this case, three. We've, we've even looked at potentially doing it in two courses. And, and also shrink down the uh, solid mechanics and dynamics stem as well. Um, and have, so we have fewer fundamental sort of core requirement courses. So where it used to be thermo, fluids, heat transfer, thermo fluid systems, now we have thermo fluids one and two and then a thermo fluid systems. And so the way we would do that is we would take some materials from thermo and fluids and heat transfer the basic stuff and we would combine that into one course all at the same time. So you have the context because it all works together anyway. We separate it out by course because it's a little bit harder, but, but really there's some fundamental heat transfer things that you can certainly learn early on in the same time you're learning thermo. And then it gets harder with the math gets, gets more involved and, and then the, the, uh, the, the material gets more involved, but you evolve as a student as well. And so you still talk about those things in the second course, but with more emphasis on math maybe 2D versions instead of 1D versions. Same with the solid mechanics as well. Um, we've also done this where we've added in a sophomore and a junior level design lab. And so this sophomore one would be centered around some of the work that's done in uh, ME260 currently. Everybody familiar with that course? It's a machine shop course. It's about 15 students max. It's eight weeks per semester and very few students can actually get into it because it's always packed. And so what we're looking to do is expand our machine shop and then incorporate every student will do a design lab with that manufacturing component. So every student has that, not just the 15 per semester that currently have it. And so we're, we're looking, that's one of the reasons we're expanding the machine shop. 
and seeing the growth down there, and the, you guys have seen there's been some increase down there. We're going to continue to have increases in there, and so part of that is um, is to support these new design courses that will happen here. And then the senior design courses will still be there, but a lot of the work and sort of learning how to design will be up front, along with more experiential learning on it. So you build something, or you design something, you build it. You design something, you build it. Um, and then now what we've done by this is we've added in, um, we've got about five electives now instead of three. And so by doing that, that opens up an opportunity to get a, a, a minor within that group of courses. So does that kind of make sense? That's, that's, the, that's what we're working on now. This is draft. This is not going to be the thing that's released. In fact, we've made changes since this slide. But, but the ideas that we use, the, the goals and the perspectives that we're using to make those changes are uh, basically the same. We're, 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 using, we're going to continue to use those. So, that, so the idea, though, is we're, we're going to hopefully think about you as an engineer are, don't need to be using 30-year-old curriculum. You need to be, you're going to be an engineer 30 years from now. And so we want you to have the skill sets that allow you to, because we don't know what 30 years is going to look like, man. Who knows what 30 years from now an engineer is going to be doing? I, I can guess, but I don't know how accurate. But so what we want is make sure you have the fundamental skill sets to be able to do whatever happens in 30 years that, that comes, comes your way. Okay. So that's kind of what... So that's kind of what we're doing here. We're, uh, it's not a huge, we, we can't do much with the math and science, although we are going to take physics 212 out, I think, and make it into an elective. And so we can, if you want to take biology instead, you still have to take a science elective, but we are going to open up some freedom there as well. Okay, any questions on that? And, and maybe just to piggyback off that, since nobody's asking, um, I would say the professional fees that you guys are paying part of to be a part of the program and all the engineering departments have these, this is a breakout of what we do with those fees. And so you can see a lot of this money is going directly towards supporting the current machine shop and, and, and building, so like the 3D printers that are over there, uh, the new mill, um, and we're, we're continuing to expand. So we're giving, we're, we're putting this money, we're redirecting this back into the quality of your education. We're not using it for other things so much. This is a you know, big chunk of that. This educational support item over here, this is really about um, funding uh, PEs and LAs in your, in your junior level courses, primarily, uh, because we want to make sure that you have as much support and success in those courses going forward. So everybody's, I'm guessing everybody in this room has had a PE, uh, PE sessions over in our tutoring center. And, and so that, that's really something that we're, that we're looking to provide as an additional benefit for, for students. So we're really put, we're funneling that money back into the program. Um, it's not going to, um, <laughs> I don't know what, um, it's, it's, it's going. It's going back to students. I guess that's the that's the main that's the main point. So, so there's a few things I wanted to uh, advance, but so some of the software costs, like SolidWorks and things like that, those are some things that we're doing with that. So, so primarily though, you can see the two big ticket items are related to educational supporting machine shop. So, so that work that you see out there in that machine shop is really hopefully directly benefiting everyone in this room. Okay. Any questions? Thoughts? Next, next question, or do you guys want to see some metrics, like what the department looks like? I have some metrics. Sure. So, okay. So, uh, this is the number of graduates that we've had over the last, trended over the last several years, uh, mechanical engineering undergrads. And so, um, you can see that back in like 2011, 2012, we were right around 55. We saw a big jump up here, and this was kind of a weird wave type of thing that you know, we, we had a bunch of students got here early and then maybe some that were lagging behind. So we had a we had a bit of a drop, but you can see how it's kind of flat flatlined a little bit right here around mid nineties. Nineties to around nineties to mid nineties. So this year um, if everything holds, we're expecting uh, ninety nine graduates this fall plus spring um, in the mechanical engineering uh, undergrad degree. So you can see that would be I you know, if it, again, if it, if it stays at 99, we will officially have the biggest class ever in uh, mechanical engineering this year. That's our 
That's our uh, that's what we're projecting. Um, this is a really complicated chart, so I don't, I'll try to explain it somewhat. But um, basically, if everybody that's in here in this room probably is uh, very familiar with the fact that we have a pre-ME major and the, or a pre-ME uh, degree or I guess degree program. And then, which at some point in your curriculum, once you meet this core requirement, you transfer into the mechanical engineering program. So, or the ME major. And so what we've done, we this shows the transition. So when that happened was in fall of 14, was when we first started admitting students into the pre-ME. And so this is the pre-ME line. So before that, there wasn't a pre-ME; it was just zero. So everybody came in over here. So in this case, what we have is a pre-ME uh, is went up, and as it's kind of leveled off at. Um, 300-ish, 300, mid-300s, um, and, and we're starting to see that kind of growing up a little bit too. So we're expecting this trend to start going back up a little bit. Um, and then this is the total number of adding those two things together. This is the ME majors. And so as we started, these are graduated ME majors and, the, and these hadn't converted in yet, so we saw a drop and now that's also leveling off over here. Um, we had a large influx. Um, we had a, a, a sizable group of students from Saudi Arabia and Kuwait that came in at this time period. And so most of this rise here is related to students from uh, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. And then we've, again, we've kind of leveled off. Questions on that one? Okay. So I, I do think right now we're poised for growth. We were probably overprescribed here in terms of our faculty numbers. Here we're starting to see this growth up. And I think we're going to grow effectively with, with more resources and a really nice machine shop and more faculty coming in like we're searching now. I think this is we're really in a great place right now. And you guys are here. You should be. Uh, this will this will be an interesting interesting to watch over the next few years. Uh, minors. If, if you're if any of you are in a minor, this is the biomedical enrollment, biomedical minor enrollment. So you can see it hovers right around 100, a little bit less. And then the blue one is the industrial engineering minor. So it's kind of up and down, but a 20 to 10 to 20. And then this uh, green one is the computational science and engineering, so CSE minor. And we have a few other minors, like you have an electrical engineering minor, there's a CS minor, there's a, I think there's a material science minor. And so we have some other ones that aren't on here, but these are the, these are the primary ones that we look at. So we do support these uh, minors with courses through our program. So those of you who've seen that, yes sir. There would all be in the future, like possibly of a minor in automotive design or you know, kind of an aerospace prep minor, something like that. Yeah, a little um, more focused, like what maybe got people into mechanical engineering in the first place. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, well, in, in back going back to the curriculum, this is kind of what this is like looking back. The curriculum's like looking forward, and so the curriculum is really about um, that. Some of the ideas that we have about emphasis areas are going to address things like that. And so what we hope to do is be able to put together packages of courses that could be focused on something like aerospace and automotive vehicle design, something like that, um, and, and have those courses packaged together so that you could actually have a degree with uh, mechanical engineering, with a certificate, or an emphasis area in vehicle design. And so you get the credential <coughs> instead of your diploma. And so that's what we want to, that's really what we want. Um, and, and, and as that happens, these these minors probably transform themselves and maybe they become certificates as well, part of the other programs. But but yeah, adding these new ones and, and so knowing what students are interested in and which one of those programs we should invest in in terms of like what we look for in faculty and how we support the courses and that sort of thing, that'll be helpful to know. You know, if we if aerospace is and vehicle design are two that we really need to work on, then I then I gotta go beat the bushes and find the right instructors to be able to come in and teach those courses. So, so that's good feedback for having. As we go forward, we, I need I need to know what the students really want to be able to, to staff that. Good question. Anything else? At this point, yes, sir. I know. Um, my passion is trying to get into prosthetics research. Prosthetics? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Yes, 
Yes, we uh, there's 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 work that's being done. Um, prosthetics by themselves is probably not explicitly done, but we do have some work in um, implants and things like that. Some of our faculty are doing research in those areas. Uh, I think uh, Trevor Lujan, Dr. Lujan also has, he has a, a patent for an implanted device. Actually, it's for veterinary um, applications, but, but there are plenty of other opportunities as well for, for humans. Uh, the other thing I would suggest is there is a, I believe it's called Brownfields, is that right? Brownfields here in town. And what is, what is her name? Brittany? Brittany. It used to be Tilden. Silver. Huh? Tilden. Tilden. T-I-L-D-E-N. Brittany Tilden is her name. And she's a former student from our program. And she went through, a, I believe she went to the University of Texas, uh, Arlington, and she went through a prosthetics school, which is kind of like, probably like a physician's assistant program or something like that. So it's not a full like medical MD type degree, yeah. but, but it's a pretty involved. And you do a residency program and all that kind of stuff. So she's She's done that, and she's here in town now. And so she's been, she's come back and spoken to groups like this before. She'll be speaking at a seminar in spring. Oh, we, we have her set up for spring. Okay, awesome. So next spring, and so she's here in town, and they and they do work in um, novel like she she brings like when she comes, she has like a whole suitcase full of prosthetics, all different sorts, like really um, passive ones, and then also the ones that you can control with your iPhone. Nice. You know, if you want to like have a little more bounce or spring or whatever. So, was, uh, Brownfields? Brownfields, yeah, it used to be, I think they've moved, but they used to be down sort of catty corner to Flying M downtown. Okay. You know where Flying M is downtown? Sort of just directly across, there's like, it looks, it's pretty nondescript. It looks like a shopping center thing, but it's, but it, that's where they did all their uh, prosthetic work. Yeah, now, I don't know where they are now, but it's still Brownfields. So. If you're looking, come see me. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dust, do you have something? Uh, Coyote Design is a local company. They run, we ran a senior exam the last year. They, um, you know, they, they develop prosthetics process, uh, products and things like that. You know, they, have, they have a clinical side, and then they also um, have their own product line of stuff they have on uh, Curtis Road. And uh, they're, they're very familiar with the university. We're working with the Department of Development Lab. So we're you know, looking to get into, you know. What was the name of the company again, Coyote Design. Oh, Coyote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't hear it. And both of them do internships. Yeah, right. Matt, yeah, yeah, definitely. Matt Perkins, I believe, is the, is the president's name. Yep, yep, they definitely don't work with MPD Lab. Um, so I just want to point out that, so it, like, like some of the questions we had earlier, um, uh, the faculty, not just me, but a lot of our faculty have connections locally. And so if you're interested in internships and things like that, you know, and you want to, it's really good to have a good connection. So reaching out to your faculty and using that, that's part of your professional network. Reach out to them. Talk things. I'm really interested in this, and you know, I'm, I'm sending you, sending them some, some of your way, Gus. But um, it's you know this. It's good. It's good if you do that because a lot of times we do have names of people that you would otherwise not have the benefit from, and they can put you in touch with the right people. So, yes, sir. I know um, I'm involved with SWE and one of the officers. We're starting to do a uh, we're getting involved with a design project that's going to be super involved with prosthetics and stuff. So if you're looking for a club to get involved with, maybe I'll meet up with Gabby. Sure, that you know, it's actually going to bounce here. But oh, I'll let you know Kelsey. Yeah, Kelsey, yeah. Kelsey Mumford. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah well, she couldn't be here today, but she wanted to see the video. So we'll say, hey, Kelsey. <laughs> People are looking to come join your club, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so we can, I can, yeah, I can get you contact information. Yes, sir. Um, this kind of became, actually, I originally was going to ask you this personally later, but this going to be a question for a whole group that yeah. someone else might have it on. I got into this because of automotive, because, I mean, if it wasn't for mechanical engineering being an option, I'd probably be at CWI studying to become a mechanic, and probably already would be one, but automotive is my passion. Now, everyone has said, oh, you should work in automotive, and I say, I don't want to live in Detroit. I just the thought of Detroit is like loathsome. Um, I doubt I could work with some of the German companies because I actually disagree with what they do now. In the past. So okay. I've kind of like said, I'm not going to be an automotive. And I'm kind of just like, well, I know power and you know, keeps me in Idaho, sure. But then I'm like, is it, I mean, does, is automotive limited to a certain geographical area? Or I mean, and, and like advice on that decision, you know. 
I want to stay in Idaho, but there's no aerospace, there's no automotive here, so it's like, yeah, what do I do? Well, that's a, that's an I, just, I see Detroit as like something that's constraining me from it because it's like I don't want to live there. It sounds awful. Well, I, you know, a lot, I like of, GM and Ford, for example. a lot of a lot of automotive companies have, have moved out of that area. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, for whatever reason, but um, I, I know that. Uh, Toyota has a, a large factory where they build Tundras and Tacomas in San Antonio. I've toured that facility. I went down there and mm -hmm. I was on a conference down there and I got to go in there and see that factory. It's fascinating. Very amazing. I mean, it's amazing to see. And they have, they build the engines for, for those vehicles. They build those engines in Huntsville where I, used, where I used to work in Alabama. Huntsville, Alabama where they do the big rockets. Now they build Toyota Tundra engines. So. And they do it with like a factory where they turn the lights out, and, and you don't even unless there's tours, they don't have any reason to have lights on. They do it automatically. It's really amazing. Um, so you you don't have to be bound to Idaho now. Idaho is um, probably not going to have a lot with automotive, and and not too much with aerospace. Although there are some groups with aerospace around, um, it's not completely devoid of, of aerospace. I would say. Um, and we're pretty close to some other areas for aerospace. Like Boeing's not far. I have a lot of students that've gone to Boeing. A lot of BSU contacts at Boeing, so what? that's a bit, it's a pretty much like state of the art aerospace company there. And then I just had uh, breakfast yesterday with uh, a former student who works with Lockheed Martin down in Houston, but she works a lot with the uh, Denver group. So they have a big, huge facility in Denver and Houston and lots of other places. So there's some there's not if, if you're willing to travel a little bit outside the border, you don't have to go far. You don't have to go to Detroit. Yeah. Now, what I would also say is that from a, uh, is anybody familiar with uh, Wab Tech and Motive Power? Yes. I know you are. <laughs> You've heard of Motive Power? And they need the locomotives. Yeah, yeah. And so they have a big facility out on Federal Way, if you haven't been out there past, if you go up on Federal Way, Broadway, Federal Way, and then go out yeah. uh, east, I guess. I had an uncle that worked for them. Okay. Okay. So that's, a, that's a, probably the biggest heavy machinery if you, if you're talking about vehicle design, um, but then, um, but then the other the other side of it is is you start to get into um, you know what, what kind of startup companies might be around. And so, so there's other things that you might get into. I, I don't know that I would say. I, I had a contact just the other day who was asking me about um, autom autonomous vehicle fleets for um, uh, campus like shuttle applications, and so taking them. So there's the, the whole idea of autonomous vehicles. Um, on campus has really taken off, and they're looking to you know do that within the, probably the next year. I've heard people say that 2021 is when automated, uh, autonomous vehicle fleets are going to really be deployed worldwide, or at least countrywide. And that seems pretty pretty com that comes that's coming up fast. There's a lot of issues with it, a lot of engineering type issues. So you know if you're if you're looking to you know if you're if, if you're if you're okay with not just turning bolts and you know cutting sheet metal or whatever bending sheet metal then and there's a lot. Of, I think there's a lot of places. Cybersecurity in you know, is going to be huge. So you could get into those industries in other ways. So you might you might start thinking about what it might look like in 30 years from now. Because if what you think about fleets of autonomous vehicles, could be used as a weapon if they were not controlled properly. I have a moral constraint so much on autonomous vehicles. Okay, <laughs> so maybe that's not the best. I mean, does it kill us a of people or me? That is a that is a classic argument that is going to have to be sort of thought through very deeply by a lot of people. Like, should I have a right to at least try to save my life? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. That's that's all. Again, that's a that's a that's going to be a, a tough issue to, to work through as we go forward as engineers. I I, I, I understand your. <laughs> I'm, I'm also concerned about that. Did you have your? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I guess I'm kind of moving back around a lot of topics we hit on tonight or today. Um, I'm from the Boise area. I know there aren't too many engineering opportunities around here, and uh, you know, as our as our class population is expected to grow over the last the next couple of years, I guess definitely in the future, um, at the amount of local companies for engineering. You know, you talk about four hundred student budget for me. You're, you're concerned about letting too many engineers out in the job market. It's going to flood it, and um, a lot of our, our courses, you know, we're, we're what I'm leading around to is in the curriculum, are you trying to design any way to encourage entrepreneurship within the engineering program? You know, is there any, is there any room for uh, classes on entrepreneurship or is that going to be a focus on the curriculum change to, you know, get students to create, you know, the next big name company in the valley? What does yeah. that look like for you? Well, 
that's a great that's a that's a great point. Now, so structurally, um, we are uh, we're changing engineering 120 into design thinking, oral communication, and part of that um, work is going to be in collaboration with the Venture College, which everybody familiar with Venture College? I think we've had we did we had one of the guys last two there. weeks, three weeks, a couple ago. weeks ago. Yeah, so we had a, he was talking about networking, but but he's he was ostensibly from the Venture College. Um, we are in talks with them about adding an emphasis area called the startup emphasis. And I have a proposal for that so that you could get a startup emphasis uh, as a part, you know, through, so taking your, your courses um, as part of these electives to, to obtain that certificate. Is anybody doing that now? There's a CO, CID course that's a Start Garage, I believe. I know there are a few students have taken it as electives currently. Or you, you're taking it next semester? Yeah. Okay, so I know some people are doing it now. Um, so within the context of our current curriculum, but we're talking about adding an emphasis area. Sure. To follow up on that a little bit, so I think it's important. I think it's a great thing for engineers. So then the question becomes, does an engineer, um, you know, are we, are we, how, how are we interacting with industry? Because does industry, are we driving industry? I mean, I think of engineers as the engine of economic development because you, we're the ones that are being creative and designing cool products, and and they're they're the one you know business people you know sort of love to take take that on and maybe make a make a business out of it. But the, the kernel of, of creativity and innovation is really sits in your lap as an engineer, and so you can go out in the industry and and do things that drive the economy. And so yeah, there's an ethical issue here with with that enrollment that that I, I appreciate. You know, that, that, that graduation number, yeah. So we're dumping 100 grads a year into the local economy. And if the economy was stagnant and didn't, didn't move and didn't grow, then that would be a problem because that's a lot of engineers. What this does, though, is these are the engines. These people are the engines of economic development, in my opinion. That putting these into the Boise community and having, you know, emphasizing creativity, and you're out there, if you're starting small businesses, that's gonna. I mean, Boise is already the fastest, or uh, states are the fastest growing state in the country. It's Idaho, Boise, and Meridian are probably the two fastest growing communities in the state. Um, we're hitting every top ten list. You know, people are looking at Boise. They're like, "Wow, this place is a really good place to work. Um, it's, it's attractive place to live. You know, we've got a lot of stuff that's really favorable for us." And so. 20 years from now, imagine, you know, if we're, if we take the same path as, say, Portland, and we're, you know, just, I don't know, Portland's a great example, but maybe Austin, Texas, like where I, where I was from, I mean, that, that's a, that's a crazy arc, you know, and, and then who knows what companies come out of that, what, what's the next Amazon going to look like, you know, what is it going to be, maybe it's autonomous vehicles. <laughs> so maybe you don't want to live in Boise anymore. <laughs> I don't like to live in What's that? I'm like, I'm afraid of growth in Boise. Literally, it's ruining the business. Well, I'm a deal we Yeah, that's, 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 yeah. That, there, there are, there are, uh, there are bad sides to it. But, but from an economic side, um, it is, a, it is an interesting uh, path. So maybe we're, maybe we're too attractive. I don't know in that regard. Um, I, I came from Boston. So, yeah. I've been here long enough now. I think I'm starting to feel like a local, but not quite. <laughs> Real locals would probably argue with me. Yes, sir. Um, so, uh, I'm a non-traditional student. I don't spend a lot of time on campus. Um, yep. We have a ton of great resources, especially like the technical uh, softwares that we have available in the computer labs and whatnot. But I don't really get to spend enough time on campus to take full advantage of those. Like, I'm thinking specifically of like SolidWorks, mm -hmm. where, especially I'm in a 260 this semester, and I find myself wanting to use it more, and even just wanting to play around with it and get better at it. I haven't touched it in like over a year. I tried getting on it last week, and I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Okay, right. Uh, is there any uh, way to, I understand it would be really expensive perhaps to do this, but to make not just SolidWorks, but a variety of these more specialized softwares available remotely so you don't have to be physically on campus. You can play around with them in your spare mm -hmm. time and get better at so got a lot of people with their hands up, but real quick, I'll, I'm going to say um, the answer is yes, and we you can get Solid, SolidWorks for download as a student. Um, now that means you have to put it on your machine, and you get a student access and it's academic version. So that's a, that's an option. But we are also looking at uh, I think it's the Google Cloud or something like that. And there's uh, anybody in 271 
Yeah, they're, they're, we're doing a pilot program for a couple. Is it? Are you in Fine Development? Yeah, it's for uh, senior design. Senior design for as well. Sorry, Zach Manufacturing. You can use SolidWorks on it back Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's a pilot program. Yeah, for it's a pilot program. Yeah, there's yeah. there is a pilot program right now, and I, maybe it's it's either Google or Amazon, one of the two. But basically, it's on a cloud, and they and they're experimenting with MATLAB and some of these other software packages, where you are just accessing it through HTML. And it's, so the com computational aspects are done remotely and you're just interfacing with it. And so you as a student could do that virtually. You could do it here on campus or you could do it off campus and it wouldn't make any difference. It's a virtual desktop, basically. I, I, it's similar, but I don't think it's exactly not a virtual desktop. Not, not exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. Well, you're running it, your computer is it's not going to computers. Really. Right. The only difference, yeah, I think the graphics kind of have to, so you, have to, you can't have like a, a really, really low end graphics card for some of those rotations and things, but but the uh, but but functionally it's just really limits basically your bandwidth. I, I had the student right. edition when I took uh, whichever class that was the initial design class like a year ago and I had it on my personal computer but it's mm -hmm. a, a limited license and it's long since expired. So. Yeah. Well like I said this is a pilot program for a couple of classes that's that's being done right now. And if it work, if it works well then I, I have a feeling they're gonna roll it out to the idea being that maybe we don't need as many computers in the computer lab, and we can put more in, more of the funding can go into supporting these online software packages, and we can we still have to buy the software package, but you can access it on your computer from anywhere, and you don't have to have it loaded on there. So that's 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 kind of a move that we're we're taking, you know, some of these pilots pilots to work out. So hopefully within another year or so that that will be, be more rolled out. Coming yeah. between. In a prime example yep. is MATLAB. I have it personally, a student license. I never even went through the department. I went through Office of Information and Tech. And oh, it's I kind see. of a, oh, see, we see your name on the list, we see your ID, you'll get a license from the school mm -hmm. to use MATLAB. MATLAB's a prime example, and a lot comes with MATLAB. And yeah, it's huge. Is there any, I don't, would it all be possible to have like a list and like kind of a resource for students here to get a, Version of SolidWorks to have, or maybe a fluid, a computational fluid dynamics for someone that wants to do aerospace or automotive, or you know, a linkage, chassis, something like that. Kind of just packages that we can get just simply with our student, you know, yeah. ID and things like that. We've started working on that. I think that we've got something on a web page that's. I'll, I'll double check. There, there are there are probably uh, there are probably versions of that out there, but I think they're probably old and they're probably not complete. And so I think collecting them all into one place would be very helpful. So uh, let us take a look at that. And it sounds like we're already maybe doing a little bit on that. I know that we have ANSYS currently, uh, you know, on that's the that's the CMD uh, fine element. We have that. We have Ab Abacus. We have SolidWorks. We have uh, MATLAB, National Instruments. No, the only ones with student downloads, I believe, are MATLAB SolidWorks. But if we have these other ones, these, these like we're saying, these remote access ones, then you can log in just like you were at a computer lab. Yeah. And so that means you could you could log in using your login, but you don't have to be on campus, which is, I think, addressing your, your point was. But you're right. I think the, the, the information is not complete, and you don't have a good list of what all that is. And so uh, we can take that on as a task to, uh, to try to compile that list and make it up-to-date and accurate because I know there are I mean you can download project for free Microsoft project for free um, from uh, on the hub or whatever it's called eHub or something like that I mean it's there's there's these little places you just have to know where to go sometimes and unfortunately that's a little bit that's not the best way to do it. so if we can put together a website that has a maybe an up-to-date list of computational resources like that I think that'd be great that'd be a good good point so thank you for bringing that up all right, well, we're five minutes over. Look who, nobody, nobody pulled me. <laughs> we don't have a host to, to pull me. Um, well, thank you so much for coming. If you, if you have a question that we didn't get to or didn't, didn't get to talk about, um, you can email me. Um, if, you, um, if you want to give me feedback on whether you thought it was useful, please let me know. Um, and we're gonna, you know, we'll start scheduling next semester seminars and we'll, we'll, right now, we'll probably go ahead and put it in next semester. But, um, but I would like some feedback. If there's some other format that you would like, please let me know. All right, thanks for coming.